And hello, good to see everybody. Welcome to today's uh, 1% Club. I got a treat. I have my business coach here today, Sean Lovejoy. He's a pastor from Birmingham, Alabama. He built a, a mega church up to over 3,000 people. And for the last nine years, he's kind of stepped down and retired from that. And he's a business coach throughout North America. He's a big superstar. So get in here, Sean. This is hey Sean, guys. This is Sean Lovejoy, my personal business coach. You guys are in great to be today. with you. I told him about this about an hour a day. I said, by the way, you're doing the 1% Club with me. You're going to get on here and help people uh, go to the next level. And so he's a special guy, a really amazing human being. And um, I'm excited to have you here today. Great to be here, my friend. Right on. So um, real quick, why don't you tell him before we dive into this, I want him to know a little bit about you. We didn't rehearse this. You didn't know yeah, how to yeah, say yeah. this, but where'd yeah. you grow up and why did you build a church and what yeah, do you know about so now? First, I'm a licensed real estate broker. Let's start there. Uh, my family's been in the real estate business for 50 years and that's all I ever wanted to do. And uh, I was crushing it in my twenties in the real estate business and felt God tapped me on the shoulders and called me into vocational ministry, planted a church in my living room, grew to be a mega church within three years, but I always felt like a business guy trapped in a pastor's body. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with John Maxwell, but his right hand guy was one of my coaches and uh, I, I built a coaching organization first as a side hustle, and uh, it really outgrew my church and uh, made a prayerful decision nine years ago. And I get to mentor and coach, you know, high net worth individuals and businesses, you know, all over North America. So I was at a Los Angeles Dodgers game last night with a client and here I'm in, with you in beautiful Sacramento. Having a cup of coffee in my Regis yes, office, local. not as sexy as a Dodgers game, but hey. He's rolling with BG. I took him to Panera Bread. We had an awesome soup and salad. We're rolling high. All right. Well, that's great. And, um, and I'm not the one that talks funny. You are, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, let's get into it. So today we're going to talk about building a healthy sales organization, building a revenue share organization. That's why everybody's here. He knows that. He knows you guys are key leaders. And so we're going to talk about what does it require? Like, um, for example, <clears throat> I think... That if, if you're going to build an organization, someone has to want to follow you. You have to be a good leader. It requires leadership. Um, so why don't you share a little bit about what your idea is? They hear, they hear from me all the time. I'm kind of excited for them to hear from you. Tell them what in your mind, from your perspective, what good leadership is. Well, first of all, you have to you have to be the culture that you want to build. You know, one of the things I talk with leaders about. Um, most of us would not say would say we we don't. Uh, participate in a victim mentality. But when we blame the economy and we blame uh, economics, we blame politics, we make excuses, um, we, we excuse ourselves from taking responsibility. And I just say to you today, if things aren't going the way you want them to be, you know, you can make excuses and you can blame or you can take responsibility. You're, you're not responsible for what you can't control. You are 100% responsible for what you can control. So it's dominating, you know, your space and taking responsibility, you know, to get better. And if things aren't going well, it's easy to point the finger at everyone else. Absolutely. You know, but a, a mature uh, leader with high EQ as well as IQ says, hey, no, I'm the lid. The bad news is, okay, you are the lid on your team. The good news is you're the lid. If you get better, everyone and everything else will get better. So, and there's a power, there's a freedom in coming and just take, hey, I can get better. I can learn some lessons here. So we were talking about Cabo and in, in March, and now we haven't, I haven't got uh, Gene Frederick to sign off on this or James, but today we're talking about doing a mastermind the day after on a 130 foot yacht. And so it'll be a very high level mastermind that anybody on this call can come to. Um, we're we're going to charge for it to help cover Cabo, but you're going to be about 30 people, very exclusive, very high end mastermind are going to be on that yacht all day with a crew of like 14. And if you've ever seen Robin Leach's Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, this is it. It's a multi, multi, multi. It's going to be fun. So the, the, that was his idea to not, not the yacht. The yacht, of course, was my idea. His <laughs> idea was to do a mastermind afterwards with a very core key group and, uh, and you deliver it like really high level, uh, intense information. So I'm very excited about that. So 
what do you do if you're out there and you're not sponsoring people? You're you're showing the model explain and they're not joining. You're going on listing appointments and you're not getting the listings. You're showing property buyers and they're buying through Century 21 or Remax and they didn't buy with you. Like what happens if you can't get anybody to follow you? And there's two things. I'm going to ask that to Sean, what you should do about that. But there's a great saying I heard a few weeks ago. You attract what you are, not what you want. That's that's a zinger. Write that one down. That was worth coming to the 1% Club today. You attract what you are, not what you want. And so I realized we want amazing, you know, let's go, you know, Green Beret, Navy SEAL type individuals, men, women, people of vision, fortitude, who have character, who have values, principle before profit, you know, do the right thing, seek first to understand or just fire off the handle and have a bad temper. You know, you attract what you are, not what you want. So how does someone become the R? How does somebody become something that people want to follow? And, and I think this gets back to, and I'm going to let you answer, but you know, the victim mentality says, well, it's not me. I'm, I talked to 20 people in the last 20 days and nobody joined, you know, and that's being a victim. You're blaming it on the ESP doesn't work anymore, or the economy or stuff. But the truth is, I know, uh, I think without trying, I signed up three in the last three weeks without trying, but we have systems and processes and like, well, that's great, Brent, that's you. The three people we signed up, two of them didn't even know me. It wasn't because it was me, it's because you have a system, but you have people to help you. Okay, I'll give you that, but here's the deal. I know people that are going berserk right now. You just got to dial it in for you. So how do they become the R? You attract what you are. How do you become? Yeah. So how many of you are honest enough to admit and acknowledge right here on the top 1% club that you probably have some leadership blind spots? Show of hands. Leadership blind spots. Okay. You know what a blind spot is, right? It's, it's, that, it's that place that's un, unobscured. You can't see it and it causes damage. If, if you don't know it's there. Okay. How many of you are honest enough to know? I know what my blind spot is. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. No, you don't. Okay. If you know what it is, it's just unconfessed sin. Okay. Huh? But the whole definition of a blind spot is you don't see it. You don't see it. You don't know it's there, but you have it. You have some leadership blind spots. So time out. I don't want to interrupt you. Everybody, I mean, you feel, I, I kind of agree. I've never thought about it. Of course, everybody has a blind spot, yes. right? Yes. Your strength becomes a weakness on the backside. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay, yes. keep going. That was good. I like it. So, you know what a really good friend does? Helps you root out your blind spots. So, you shouldn't listen to most people, but you find a few people that love you and love the vision that you have in front of you, and you should listen to them. You know, ask your significant other about your weaknesses, and, and, and they'll tell you in short order. And start rooting out your blind spots. The growth in leadership is the process of rooting out your blind spots in leadership and getting better at the areas that are exposed, that are limiting you, that you're not even aware of yet. And we need each other. Frankly, we need community. We need relationships, you know, to do that so often. You need a coach, whatever. So yeah. I'm doing that in his life, shooting straight with him, challenging on some things. He has some blind spots. Shocker. Okay. But he's rooting them out and he's going to grow because of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I love I love what you're saying. So there's, there's, I think, a couple of ways people can get help. They can hire a coach for sales, hire a coach for agent attraction. You got a track boss with .com with Randy Bird. It's amazing. And Pete Middleton and Gail DeMarco and all these amazing people that are part of that here, rave reviews. Or in sales, you got Bill Pipes, you got Sean Kokoska, you got Verl, Workman, Workman Business Systems. You have Tom Ferry, Mike Ferry. There's so much to choose from on the sales side of it. So, But those all cost money, right? They cost, why Lopo costs money. So some of you are going, look, I don't have, ooh, Coach Jeff Sutherland is entering the room right now. So I, I grabbed him. But um, so here's the point. Some of you are going, ah, but I don't have the money, so I can't. Okay. But you can. Um, I remember when I didn't have the money and my kids ate at Wonder Bread from my neighbor's house, frozen Wonder Bread, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I used my neighbor's phone to call prospects to set up time to go show property because I couldn't turn on my home phone and I couldn't buy groceries for my family. 
um, when I first got in real estate uh, 27 years ago, just we just gone bankrupt. We uh, I was driving Steve Hillier. Let me borrow an extra truck. He had I'm driving on a beat up Chevy Silverado. That's how I started real estate. And so yeah, I, don't, like, Brent, I can't afford a coach. OK, but you what you can do is get in the right rooms. And Zoom rooms, right? One of the right rooms was a thing called, um, it was really popular a few years ago. And, and um, um, it was uh, Clubhouse. Remember Clubhouse? You could get in the Clubhouse rooms. It was all audio. Remember Clubhouse, you guys? There's, there's Zooms. There are meetings you can show up to, but you can get in the right rooms and seek out people that are achieving at a high level. The, the gentleman who runs my real estate business today, John Jennings, he was a Redfin, no, he was a Purple Bricks manager for Sacramento. I spoke at an event. I said, if anybody wants to meet me for coffee, there's a couple hundred people, meet me. I'll have coffee with you. And the place thundered. And I, I did a really good talk. Sometimes my talks are okay. Sometimes I, I get wood on the bulb. Sometimes I had a grand slam. This was a grand slam day. I said, I'm going to hear from about three of you out of 200. Here I am, sold thousands and thousands of properties. You love, I said, I'm only going to hear from about three of you. And I, I think I might've heard from four or five of them, but John Jennings was one of them. He goes, yeah, I'd love to meet you for coffee. Because, and this was like five years ago, but I'm, or, or no, maybe three years ago, but I'm not joining EXP. Is that cool? I go, totally. Well, we don't even ever have to talk about EXP. And I met with him month after month, after month, after month, after month, after month. And I poured into him. John Jennings got with the right person. And of course, I had no idea Purple Bricks was going to pull out of America July 3rd, later that year. And he called me at 11 o'clock at night because we'd become close because I poured into him. There's another gentleman who came up with this idea. You're going to be hearing about it. And um, he owns um, Mr. Newport Beach, Mr. Beverly Hills, Mr. San Francisco, Mr. Miami. He owns everything nationwide, thousands and thousands of locations. Dave Linegar from Remax wants his idea. Gary Keller wants his idea. Gary Keller's been begging him. Dave Linegar, Tom Ferry, they all want it. They're like, we want to do a deal with you. And he one by one ruled them all out. And uh, he said Keller Williams was like cultish. They insisted upon 51% ownership. They wanted to really, it was, it was freaky. Uh, they know real estate. And then the Remax guys didn't care about the agents at all. They just look how much, how can we monetize it? How can we make money? And he said, it was disgusting. He goes, and Tom Ferry, I won't even get into why that didn't work out. He goes, I talked to a lot of people, like the biggest players in the industry. His brand, I'm calling you back because you're the only one who didn't want anything from me. You were the only one I enjoyed talking to, didn't feel slimy afterwards. And so we're having a huge meeting with, he wants to do something with me. I'm like, yeah, sure, buddy, we'll talk. So we're gonna spend an hour tomorrow with my leadership team, but you attract what you are, not what you want. And so um, I think I got off topic there. I lost the topic, you know, pull me back. I, I can't even remember what we were talking about. about. Oh, get in the right rooms and how yeah, John Jennings, you. you can seek people out for free. Uh, John Jennings didn't pay me. If you will ask the, the someone you want to emulate to meet you for coffee or breakfast, he didn't say, can I meet with you every month for that? But you just say, is it okay if we meet again next month? And, and then, and then, right. And then, and then you, you come in and he was there with a notepad and notes. And so you can get with the right person. You can get in the right rooms for free. None of you are paying for the 1% club here. I mean, we all donate to sell a home, save a child. Hopefully if you're here, it's not a requirement, but hopefully you are. Um, and then I do this as a give back, but I think, and then there's the coaching, but is that pretty much what you'd recommend a podcast? Like how do they become what they want to be to attract who they want to attract? Is that pretty much it? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, statistically probably eight out of 10 human beings do not have a personal growth plan for their life. You know, so most of us have a business growth plan. We don't have a personal growth plan. What, what, what is your plan to grow? And I just, I applaud you for being here today. I know you don't have time to be here today, but this is, there's a difference between an expense when it comes to your time and money and an investment. This is an investment into you to get better. If, if nothing else, to, to get in rooms with people who think bigger than you, you know, it's important, you know, and so you, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, you know, but I, I meet so many leaders and some of you don't raise your hands who say to me, well, I'm not really a reader. Well, I don't, I don't really listen to podcasts. Well, I'm not into conferences. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Because if you stop learning, you stop growing. And if you stop growing, your team will stop growing. And in the Great Resignation, Harvard Business Review is telling us this. The stats say 
People are leaving their jobs, not for more money, but for quality of life issues. And people don't want to be managed, but they do want to be led. So if you become more of an inspiring person and a, a person that people want to follow, it gives you competitive advantage in the marketplace today because people will work for less money for you, especially millennials on down. Um, they're, 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 they're accepting less money to be inspired by people and have a quality of life and someone that will make them go home at a reasonable hour and be with their family. And if you can discipline yourself, the most, the scariest thing I tell Brent people all the time is that if you're the leader of the team, you are the most disciplined person on the team. <laughs> I know that's scary. So it, but, but it's downhill after that. So if we can help people live disciplined, ordered lives and keep their families together while they're building this and you model the way, it gives you competitive advantage in the marketplace too. It works. Absolutely. And people sniff it out. They can tell if your life is a disaster. Nobody knows, right? We can read other yeah. people's mail so easy. You symptoms. can just see he, she, they're a, they're a snowball going down a Swiss Alp. Their, their life is a mess. Um, and it's not that everything's perfect. Kathy and I had a heated conversation on the way to pick him up at the airport this morning. I'm just straight up being honest with you. It was, I felt strongly about one a certain thing and had to do with Cabo and she felt strongly about another thing. And I said something wrong, which she went Bing! <laughs> and, and then she let me have it. She got heated, but you know, here's the thing. We were able to talk it through and we even worked with him on that topic. Cause it's, it's a major, it's probably like the most, like the thing that keeps us up at night. And, um, and we worked through it. And when she left just now, she goes, okay, you guys do the 1% club. I'm going to go take, we'll reconnect here. I meet with my entire organization, my leadership team at four o'clock today, as far as not my organization, but the, you know, people on my staff. And so, you know, to talk about culture, to talk about vision, to talk about the future with, with Sean. And, and so, but we kissed, we hugged, there was zero remnants of weirdness. Now at the time before we picked him up, it was a, a little 4th of July fireworks because I can be intense and she's learned to stand up for herself and not just be a pushover and she'll, she comes back. But the key is, I think is, is making up and, and, and me listening and, and her and we, we work it out. So I want to say this, um, Ver, Vern Verl Workman says, what good is it to succeed at EXP revenue share or build a hundred million dollar sales team and get divorced? Like that's a 50%, like you want to, you want to lose half your income the rest of your life or it's a really like, like, no, y'all would never do that. Like, okay, well, we just fell out of love. No, you weren't working on your marriage. Remember that personal growth plan that includes your marriage, man. If you don't maintain and grow like, oh, we're doing, we're in maintenance mode. That's death mode. You're either growing or going the other way. There's no middle ground. And so he was telling me about a Netflix documentary about somebody you all know. And he told me the story. I'm like, wow, that is fascinating. And we all kind of like this guy. I like him. I think he's a likable guy. Go ahead and tell him who the Netflix document it's out. Now you can all watch it tonight. I'm going to go watch it after he, what he told me, but who is it about? Yeah. Give me thumbs up. Have you seen the new documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger? Who's seen it? Wave at us. You seen One, it? One, two, up? three, four. Three or four of you. That's it's, about it. It's fascinating. I'm going to watch it tonight, I think. I, I actually admire Arnold. I think he's a good leader. I mean, he has a great vision. He's known for the terminology of having no plan B and sticking to your plan A. And he, he drew up the dream for his life uh, as a Mr. Olympia and a movie star in his bedroom as a teenager and, and stuck to it. You know, but at the same time, he was very, very candid in the documentary about you know, failures. moving off and leaving his family, you know, in the pursuit of success at times. And now he lives alone with two dogs in this massive mansion. And it's a little sad. It's a little sad. You know, he's not been able to put the wheels back on in, in good big chunks of his life, you know, relationally with his children and all of that. And yet we would we would depict him as the, the master of success, you know, in yeah. so many ways and has. But, you know, he will be quick to tell you, I lost part of my soul in, in, in pursuit of Let's you know, not do that. the dream for my life. Let's not do that. So Sean and I are messaged to you today 
is work on your marriage. Fall in love with your husband again. Fall in love with your wife again. Find a way to, to fix it if you possibly can, right? Yeah. And um, I, I think that's really important. And there's always hope. Miracles happen, you know? Um, there's a song about miracles um, always happen, silver linings. I wish you remember it, but it was, I listened to that song a thousand times when Kathy and I were separated in 2010 for eight months. Um, oh my gosh, I, I wish I should remember the name of it, but that song kept me alive. But, um, you know, we don't want you to blow up your families. We don't want your kids to have to have a whole nother set of in-laws and, and then and then you get remarried, she gets her and then hold it together, um, right? I mean, Absolutely. we care about your family. Absolutely. So, yeah. I'll, I'll give you this term. You can take it away. You might want to write this down, type this, type this up. Choose. My wife and I don't argue. It's more spiritual than that. We call it intense fellowship We're from the South. And so we, we, we have the same Myers-Briggs personality profile, okay? So we have fought all the way down the stretch. And this past Sunday, we celebrated 30 years of marriage. We've never been unfaithful to each other. And at least that's what she tells me. And, and we've just chosen, remember this phrase, we've chosen. This is true for your team as well, okay? I actually want you on your team to have more conflict, okay? Healthy conflict. I want, I'd rather you have... Intense fellowship than artificial harmony. Ooh, that's good. I'd rather you have intense fellowship over artificial harmony. So it's okay to fight if you resolve the issue, you know, and if you'll train the people on your team, you talk about having have an attractive competitive advantage recruiting right now. It's, it's, to, it's to build an environment where there's no drama on your team. You have a drama free team. We talk to each other. We don't talk about each other. We fight fair. We have intense fellowship over artificial like harmony. And, and we trust each other because we got to get a sign up around here. We fight fair. Put it, <laughs> I like that. Put it up at home. We fight fair. So what does that look like to, to fight fair? And I'm going to tie it into culture. There's a culture of your, with your kids. You have little ones. Some of you have teenagers. God help you. We'll be praying for you. Then you, even when they go off to college, it's worse because colleges want to turn them into like crazy. We won't even go there. But, um, you know, how, how do you um, how do you fight fair? And and oh, I think you explained that. But then bringing that into culture at the office with their businesses, with their tribe, the group they're attracting, the group they have. You want to speak to that? A little yeah, bit? I talk with teams about building what we call a last 10 percent culture. Most people say 90 percent of what they're thinking and they hold back the last 10%, you know, on your team, in your family, with your children, in your marriage, every relationship in your life, build a last 10% culture. You know, now as the leader, you've got to be willing to receive the last 10%. <laughs> you can't be a defensive leader and lose your cool. You know, every time somebody wants to challenge or help you root out one of your blind spots. So over the teams I've led the last 20 years, Brent, it's very normal for someone who works for me Say, hey, you got a minute? Can I have a last 10% conversation with you? Like you didn't mean to, but in that meeting, like you totally, we've been working on something, you totally disempowered us. Well, thank you. Hey, you just helped me, you know? And and my wife often uh, shares with me her last 10%. And it, we, when we get that kind of honesty out on the table in our teams, it breeds trust on levels that people can't comprehend, you know, to build that last 10 percent in to be totally can the fastest growing demographic of the okay world. i think i get it i wasn't understanding so you're saying don't be 90 percent in be 100 percent. go after the last share, 10%. share that last 10 percent of what you're thinking ah okay i wasn't i wasn't getting it. how about you guys i was lost share that last 10 percent of what you're thinking make sure in a meeting the last 10 that everybody's not just nodding their heads you know in agreement now when did when do they like let's say you're thinking i'm really peeved here and I want to just you know drop a, a bomb in, in the meeting like there's a time I think to hold your tongue though how yeah. do you know when when like you know the bible even says you know you know sometimes you need to just be quiet and, yeah. and not say that or do that and, and and show wisdom to how do you know the difference there? well the last 10 percent is best always shared first privately Mm -hmm. Okay, privately. One -on -one. I'm not, I love that. I'm not going to take a shot at you in, in a, a group setting with a passive aggressive jab, you know, That's if good. we haven't spoken about it, you know, in advance. 
But especially when we're trying to get ideas out on the table and you're asking yeah. everybody what they think about Cabo, yeah. you really want Rob's opinion. Yeah. If he just nods his head and agrees, but he's not really bought in, we've got a problem. You know, so so but if he pulls us aside later, yeah, like Barry Mathis. So a lot of you know Barry Mathis. Wave at me if you know the name Barry Mathis. Wave that there's one, there's two, there's three. He's a tough character. High D maxes the chart, says what he thinks, means what he sells, not afraid. He's a last. 10%. He only has a 1% left. He's a last 1% guy. He usually says 99% of what he's thinking, if not 100%. But he used to blast me in front of my group with 34. Like, this is stupid. Why are we doing it this way? <laughs> I pull him aside. I go, look, man, you could beat me in private. You could talk like that. Do not do that in front of the group. You know, I mean, this is my organization. And, right. and so I all disagree with Glenn or Michael uh, uh, Valde Valdez. What it was, whatever his name is, our president. I know about this. Uh, and um, and but I don't do it in front of everybody. I'll pull him aside. I've had discussions with Glenn Sanford that might surprise you very respectfully, yeah. but going, I agree to disagree, and here's why. And we've worked through things, but always in private. And so never publicly embarrass people or say something. And don't, you know, be the person who lifts up the room, the person who adds to the room. And I don't think it's being fake, but when you know, if I say this, it's going to really, you know, some people get off on just destroying the mojo of the room. You, if you're really upset about something, go to Dennis D'Souza, you know, go to Steve Jones, go, go to David Mills in private and talk to him. Hey, this has really got me bugged. And then like, oh, you know what? You're right. Next meeting, I'm going to address that. I'm going to own that. I was wrong. I've, I've apologized to people, James, Rob, different people in my group in front of 40 people. I just said, I was so wrong about this. And I just publicly want to apologize to Dylan uh, Nanaka. And did I say that? No, I can't see Nanaka. Is that how you say it, Dylan? Your last name, give me a thumbs up. Did I say it right? He's probably not, but he's giving me a <laughs> thumbs up. The last 10%, Dylan. I did it right. Okay. And, and all it, own it, man. Our clients want to own it. You want to get a lawsuit? I was wrong. I've dropped this. I'm going to take full ownership. You know, the buck stops here and I'm going to make it right. And then some, but I think that's key. Yeah. And I would say for you, if, if you're on today's call or you're on another call, you realize, well, I've not done it all well. You know, I think two of the most credibility building words a leader can say to their team is I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. what our tendency is our pride keeps us from wanting to admit our weaknesses and faults. And by the way, they know you lost your cool. Yeah, you, you're but, not hiding anything. Yeah, they, they know you acted like a jackass. Can I say that on this call? Yeah, you you know, so so you get credibility by saying, hey, guys. I haven't, wrong. I haven't handled this well. I haven't been as available. We haven't been as consistent with our team huddles, you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm going to get better and we're yeah. going to get better. And I'm telling you, you get instant credibility, you know, in the room. And yeah. the, the one thought you gave me earlier, so, so everybody pull out your smart devices. Okay. Everybody pull out your smart devices. Okay. Mm -hmm. I tell leaders when they see your number come up on their caller ID. Okay. They have one of two private thoughts about you. <laughs> oh, hey, it's Steve. Oh, hey, it's David. Oh, hey, it's or oh, hey, it's Brent. You know, or <laughs> I'm not sure. yeah, the second private thought is oh, hell, it's Brent. Yeah, you know, and and if no you way. want if you want to be build an attractive magnetic team, you got to become the oh hey leader. I like it. Not the oh hell leader. You yeah. know, and not be transactional um, in nature, but rise above, get out of the weeds and inspire people, yep. inspire people. Hey, final thought as we wrap up today's 1% Club, how important is it to create magic moments for your inner circle, your team, your organization, and how can they go about doing it? I have some of my thoughts. I've shared it before, but how about you? Do you think it's important to create magic moments for your, your kids, your wife, your husband, and your team, your clients? But in this case, let's talk about the agents that they've attracted the organization how is that important and how would they go about doing that? Well, I don't think most people set out to say, I'm going to suck the life out of my family or I'm going to suck the life out of my team. We just don't have the margin, which allows the preparation to create those magic moments. So I, I believe in you guys, you're very capable of doing it. You just got to build in the margin. Like 
don't 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 rush into a meeting with zero margin and no preparation. That's going to be a bad meeting. That's not going to be a magic moment. You know, don't don't walk in the door of your home at the end of the day still with the cell phone glued to your ear. OK, you're not going to create a magic moment. OK, so you, it requires some margin as you transition from conversation to conversation during the day and a little bit more preparation for those environments and those encounters. For example, psychologists tell us when we go home at the end of the day, OK, if you work outside the home, when you attend home, the first eight minutes dictate the culture for the home for the remainder of the evening the first eight minutes. So think about your average like first, that. first eight minutes. I like it. What about when you walk in the office, when you walk in down the hallway, you know, the first eight minutes dictate the tone and the culture for hours, you know, that follow. So, and that just requires a little bit of margin, a little bit of prep, you know, um, raised three, raising three teenagers. There were times when I had to close, you know, grip the steering wheel before I went into my house and said, God, I'm going in, you know, but, but, but I, I need to be emotionally prepared, but you've got to be emotionally prepared, you know, to be the leader that you need to be. They need you. They need you. All right. So we're going to end with this. That was very good. We're going to give you two homework assignments. Number one, when you get home today, and for some of you, it's already, uh, five o'clock at night, when you get home, I want you to set the pace, set the, the temperature in your home, come home and tell the people that are there that you love them, grab them their little cheeks, tell them how special they are to them. Now it might be weird. Don't grab your wife's little cheeks or your husband's and, <laughs> and, um, and just look them in the eyes and give them a hug. Not like hey, a little hug, like hold them, embrace them, give them one of those good hugs and just tell them how proud you are of your kids, your wife, your husband, your family, be lift that room in the home, go home and do an experiment and come home. Like you just want a million dollars or, or I don't know, whatever would be exciting to you. Or you, you listed 10 on, you're just pumped. And, and, but, but being conscious that you are the leader of your home. If you come home grumpy, tired, and beat, that's just what you're teaching your kids to be grumpy, tired, and beat. Come home on the phone. You teach them that like, I'm not even going to talk to you. I'm busy talking to my client, sit in the car, finish the conversation, do a few more texts, wrap it up, and then turn it off, put it on airplane mode. So it's not even vibrating. Go home in eight minutes. We're just asking them for eight minutes. eight minutes. You set the temperature in your home. Watch what happens the other day. I remember it was probably four or five days ago. Kathy woke up, I think it was Saturday morning. She was in the best mood. I mean, she's usually in a good mood. I'm like, man, you woke up on the right side of the bed. She was just excited and, and her joyful. And, and I, thought, I felt great. It was not that I felt great. She made me, and I usually feel pretty good. And, and so I'm going to give you that homework tonight and tomorrow morning when you wake up. Now, if your wife or your husband's like one of those sleepy people, they don't appreciate Tigger. Now, I'm kind of obnoxious. I literally bounce on the bed next door, and I'm like, Tigger, man. I'm like, zzz, zzz, zzz. I'm like, vibrate. I'm like, she's like, aren't you tired? I go, no, I'm pumped. And I'm, I, I, if I wake up at six, I'm pumped. I'm like, I'm, I literally sit there, I lay in bed, and I'm just vibrating. I'm like, boom, let's go. And, and so I can be a little much. So I try to be, but sometimes really? I'll be, oh, yeah. Really? Yes, yes. And so, but it's so much fun. And so, but you know, there's, you don't want to be annoying, like, hey, I made you some coffee and I did this. And today I thought we could do this. I'm so and then so try to do these two homework assignments, once for your family and once for your spouse and blow their mind. You know, um, anyways, that's about it. It's great. Love you guys. Was this good? Wave at us. Was it good? Thumbs up. We good. We good. All right. Hey, we're on in uh, six minutes with the uh, Mastering Sales with Brent Gove. I'm going to have Sean help me with some sales tips. He is a licensed real estate broker. We're going to talk everything real estate. We'll be back in five minutes. Love you guys. Have a good day.